We're continuing our partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute and joining me in studio this week are two of their top objectivist thinkers, Gina Gorlin and Yaron Brook. Welcome to the Rubin Report. It's great to be back. You are a top objectivist thinker. You, <laughs> you exhale. <laughs> But you officially are now a top objectivist this thinker. This makes it official. Yeah, well, why? Davis anointed the, uh, you. Uh, I don't know that I'm the one that no makes higher. the anointing. I think you do the anointing here. Something like that. Yeah. Something, like, Something that. like that. All right, there's a ton I want to talk yep. to you guys about. And as you both know, and I think as most of the audience know, this is just one in a series of these type of conversations that we're having. I thought what would be interesting for this is that if we started talking about careers a little bit, because people have heard me talk about this, yep. you were instrumental in my career change and success because we were doing our first ever sit down. We had never met before. I was on Aura TV. This is about, it's three and a half years yeah, ago or so now. This seems like another lifetime ago. And I was realizing that I wanted to take the show in a slightly different direction at the, rather than the network I was at and that I wanted to own my own in independent production company, all of the things that I have now. And I sat with you for an hour and you talked about rational self-interest and, and several other uh, objectivist ideals. And I quite literally ended that interview, walked into the green room, said to my director and my, uh, and my producer that I said, I'm leaving. I hope you guys will join me. <laughs> we quit our jobs. We yep. left our salaries, health insurance, the whole thing. And, and we went independent. And I'm happy to report it has all worked out. So when I talk about these ideas, these are not just ideas to me, these are, these are concrete things. That's the most I've ever talked at the top of a show. <laughs> You're on, take it away. No, I, I, I think I, I, it, that's inspiring and I'm glad I had that kind of impact and uh, it, I'm glad it didn't go the other way. Yeah. You know, lawsuits and all you this stuff. Right. You would not be here now if it went the other right. way. Yeah. <laughs> for for yeah. multiple reasons I wouldn't be here. Yeah. But no, look, the fact is that what we choose to do in our career, what we choose to do um, as, as work right, is, is so crucial. The fact is, I mean, I know how hard you work. Uh, you know a little bit about my travel schedule. Yeah, no, I, and yeah, you're doing you know, it. We spend most of our lives at work. We spend most of our lives pursuing our career. And it's so important that people choose something they love. They do something they enjoy, selfishly enjoy. They do it for their own benefit. So money's important, right? You can't discount money, but sometimes it's worth taking that big risk and, and risking all that money and risking the, the safety of health insurance and all that to pursue something you really love and to pursue something that you can control. You know, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about finding meaning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ayn Rand, one of the cardinal one of the cardinal values to pursue in life is purpose. And I think meaning and purpose are very similar in terms of content. And at the end of the day, where we find our meaning and where we find our purpose for most of us is in the career we choose. Or, or that's a good life when we have it in our career because we, we're gonna spend so much of our energy, so much of our focus, so much of our thinking, and so much of our life you know, make sure that you really love it, make sure that you really enjoy it. Yeah, and yet so many people don't. So why do you think at, at the psychological level, so many people don't take that issue seriously enough to go, it's not that I should just have a job, right. it's that I really should do something that I love. Yeah, so the kind of fervor and idealism with which Yaron just spoke of the sacred importance of finding a job you love I don't think that exists in our culture. I don't think people are given the kind of guidance and the kind of inspiration as they're growing up, as they go to school, that would power them through the inevitable challenges involved in actually taking the risks. I mean, what I love that story that is such a great example. It's like life imitating art, you know, where that had to have been a really scary and yeah. uncertainty fraught decision the, the for The night you. before. But, but, but it's more than that, right? Yeah. Because you, throughout your life in some way, and I don't want to make the show all about you, but <laughs> throughout your life have, have in a sense done that, right? Because you, you, you took a very unconventional route to, to go into comedy and to, to, to go and you, you've, you, you've been a risk taker throughout. Yeah. And I think so many people are conditioned to, to just fit in, yeah. to do what's expected, to do what the family has done. Um, and we're not taught when we're young to be independent thinkers, to be, to be independently motivated, and that to that's introspect, good, right? yeah, and that's and good. And that, that is what it means to be good. Mm -hmm. You know, that all of the focus that, you know, the character values that we see up on the wall at school and the praise that we get, you know, sometimes we get praised for 
good grades or for productivity it's been earlier on but as we start to grow up it's like that's de-emphasized mm -hmm. and what's emphasized in terms of how you earn the stature of you know this is a good person this is a person we can look up to yeah. is by doing things unrelated to your own passionate career path yeah and the fact is you have to sustain so much motivation and you have to go against so many grains in order to actually design a career that is really personal to you and that brings the kinds of rewards that we're t that really make life worth living. Right, and it seems to me that there's also a secondary benefit, which is that the rewards will keep coming. So even mm -hmm. just in the last few months, and not to make this about <laughs> me, but, this, but there's an interesting piece of this, which yeah. is yeah. in the last couple of months, I decided to leave Patreon. And the night before we officially left, I thought, man, did I just screw this whole thing yeah. up again? Which was the exact feeling I had years ago. And we actually didn't. We're thriving yeah, again. Yeah. So it, it sort of feeds on a reward system if you if you do things that are a little risky well, that you're passionate about. Well, one of the beauties of Ayn Rand's ethics is that the moral is the practical. Yeah. And it turns out that if you follow morality, if you do the right thing, if you do it rationally, thoughtfully, it pays off. Th it pays off. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. stuff happens. Yeah. So it 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 is in this world. I think good stuff happens to good people if you define good people right. And it's, it's in this life, and, and this is the whole focus on, on happiness and success and, and pursuing your values. If you do it right, then you, the reward is happiness, yeah. the reward is success. And by and large, what's really important about that is it's not that the reward comes from like people handing out you know, praise and patting you on the back, you know, where somebody came up with a set of rules that if you follow them, mm -hmm. you'll get rewarded. The reward comes from reality because the principles are causal principles that actually identify facts about what you need to do if you want to experience a good life as a human being. You know, you have to act on principle. You have to think long term. You have to be honest with yourself, right? Like there are reasons why those things pay off in the world. And mm -hmm. if you can see that, if you can start, because what you're talking about is you're learning and this is in therapy, this is the process I try to enact for my clients. I try to help them see what you're seeing every day by making these difficult choices and then seeing the logic play out, yeah. right? Like, of course, when I actually take this bold, honest risk that both attracts the people in my audience who are like-minded and who are looking for that inspiration, and they're the ones I want watching my show, you know, and the reason I'm doing that is because I value being able to speak my mind on my own terms. And part of the reason I value that is because it attracts a large audience. Right? Like, it's all so self-reinforcing. It, it, it then feeds itself. So yeah. is part of the issue that scares people about this is that there's probably young people watching this right now. Let's say someone's just out of college. Yeah. And they, they can't get the job that they love right now. They've got to do some crappy jobs well, yeah. first. Sure. Sure. But that doesn't make them happy in sort of the immediacy, perhaps in if they were looking at it the long term, they would look back and go, oh, those are the good old days. So, so but you can't always, not every job is gonna bring you that, that reward. No, and, and look, it, everything is risky, and risky means that some stuff fails, and, and failure is part of life, and, and failure is something we need to learn how to deal with, and I think part of the damage our educational system does is it doesn't teach kids how to deal with failure, partially because we've, we've outlawed failure, right? Everybody gets a ribbon. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so, we, so we outlaw failure, so you don't learn how to deal with failure, and we need to teach people. But also, our educational system doesn't teach kids how to introspect and how to figure out, what do I love? What are my values? What do I really want to pursue? So when they get to adults, so many, so many of them, and I was like this, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't, you know, but when I did it, I did it well. I, I learned to like it. And I was always looking on the, on the lookout for, okay, what I really enjoy, yeah. you know, so I could switch. I've had, I don't know, five careers, five mm -hmm. different things. And I think we don't train kids to, to be on the lookout, to, to really be able to do that. So they, they're afraid of failure. They're not sure exactly what it is that they really want to do. And we haven't taught them to think long term and to accept the fact that, yes, all of us went through periods where it was really rough and right. it was really hard and we didn't do and we yeah. didn't enjoy it. Yeah, you right? don't get the great fun. gig day one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and that that's part of the glory of it. Yeah. That I think part of what makes the even the grunt work and the failure worthwhile and actually part of the experience of a good life is 
knowing what it means to you and knowing why you're doing it, like that is actually rewarding. Yeah. Even when you're in the throes of despair, having just you know been rejected for the hundredth time, but when you know that this is this experience and my courage in facing it and not flinching and not turning back is part of this mission that yeah. I'm on, as we've talked about, that itself is a tremendous experience. Well, it's funny to me because not to do it again, but <laughs> but but this shows this, well, but this shows the, the relevance Absolutely. of this. I now, when, when I was a struggling comic and I used yeah. to have to hand out tickets in Times yeah. Square no matter rain nor sleet nor <laughs> yeah. snow and it was miserable and I'd have to wear two pairs of socks and oh, two yeah. jackets sure. and it was horrible and I did this for years just yeah. to get on stage and I remember I hate, I love being on stage but I hated everything else yeah. yep. but I do view those now as the good old days. Yeah. Exactly. Not because they're better than, than today, today is definitely better but there's something the, the fact that I did that, that I was able to actually do that, I don't even know where it came from but I, I, but I did. <laughs> But part of what happiness is, 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 is being challenged and meeting those challenges yeah. and attaining your value in spite of the obstacles that, you know, reality throws at you. To get there, and reality's going to throw. It's not, it's not going to be easy. And that sense of accomplishment is what helps us build that self-esteem that's so necessary for that, for the sense of happiness that I think you get once you reach the point where you're really successful. And... And that building process at the time is is hard, yeah, and it's painful, and it's un, it's not fun. But looking back on it, it's like, yeah, I did that. It's the good it's, old days. It's the good old days. That was kind of cool, and, yeah. and I succeeded and achieved yeah. something. And look at me today. It, it's a consequence of those actions that I took back then. Yeah, and yeah. I think part of what makes it possible is having at least some vision, even at the time. You know, I work with people, so there's this phenomenon now called failure to launch. It's actually, it has a name now. So these are college kids who graduate, move back home, don't know what they want to do yet, and then they're stuck. Mm. They're just living in their old room or their parents' basement, and they're being taken care of, and usually at some point they get depressed and anxious because they're not yeah. doing anything. And then we enter into this conversation of, okay, but what do you want? Like, mm -hmm. what's actually going to move you? And like the motor is sort of shut off. Mm -hmm. And what I try to do is find ways to like rev them back up by usually by offering some kind of vision, even if it's going to fail after a week, you know, find something to do that is both difficult and that you can be proud of. And it might just be asking out a girl or a boy, you know, or it might be giving a talk at Toastmasters. It doesn't yet have to have a clear end game mm -hmm. except for the spiritual end game which is to learn what it's like to struggle and to triumph in a difficult goal yeah what, what about people let's move it from just the young people sure. but what about now someone's middle-aged yeah. and they don't love what they do and yeah. they've got car payments and mortgages oh, yes. and kids and all sorts of responsibilities and they can't or in their mind at least can't take that crazy risk how do you how do you help that person come around to something while they have more responsibility and maybe they're not as crazy as the wide-eyed 20-year-old who's willing to you know, bust his butt to do anything? Well, partially I'd say it, that is a, a reason why it's so important when you're young to get the attitude right. Not to get the exact profession or the exact thing that you're going to do, but to get the attitude right so that you can start building towards something yeah. and you can be more adaptive as you grow older. Because it is, it's more objectively more difficult mm -hmm. because you've got commitments, you've got payments. Mm -hmm. And I would say people like that, the, the, you know, they, they've got it. You've got to find something you love to do. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's going to drain you. Whether, whether you can start with a hobby or whether you can start uh, getting, uh, going to school at night and, and learning something new. Or, or, you know, if you, if you want to be a stand-up comic, you know, go to plenty of theaters here in Hollywood. I wouldn't go recommend stand anyone do that, yeah. but the other, the other but, all sounded fine. But there's always something that you can do and, and dabble to see is this something I could go into as you maybe start transitioning your life. But it is, it just highlights how important it is to, to, again, not get it right when you're young, because look what you're doing today versus what you did then, but to get the attitude right, the, the, the idea of challenging yourself, the idea of hard work, the idea of I'm gonna pursue my values, I'm gonna set dreams and I'm gonna go for them, that kind of attitude. And unfortunately, I think today with young people, We've got too much of a safety net, right? I mean, this idea that kids can go back home mm -hmm. after college. It, you know, I, when, 
I just think of myself, I didn't want to go back home. I, yeah. You know, that would have meant I'd failed completely. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to get out of home at 16, never mind <laughs> waiting to 18 for when yeah. I could finally get out of there. And I think that the, the, the idea of not doing anything as comfortable, right, as playing video games, as yeah. that's your comfort place, that is corrupting. And that's somehow, again, part of our educational system has to change. People have to become, and I think this is what this philosophy kind of teaches us, you have to be ambitious about your life and you have to take responsibility for it in a, not in the kind of superficial sense that every conservative says, you know, personal responsibility, but in the deep sense, your life is yours, your mind is yours. And you have to, at a fairly young age, start taking responsibility for how am I gonna shape my life? How am I gonna shape my mind? How am I gonna shape my career? How am I gonna shape what I'm gonna do? Knowing you're gonna make mistakes, knowing you're gonna fail, knowing all this stuff, and, but, but getting to that mode of, this is my life and I'm gonna live it. Well, that, that's why I find this so fascinating yeah. because so much of the messaging we get out of the media and out of academia and everything else is that it's the, it's the fault of the system. It's never, it's never put on yep. the person and yep. not that we all come from different things. Some of us have some advantages that others don't. You might come from more money or you might come from a better family or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but that it is ultimately on you. Yeah, so I want to, both speak to that and actually follow up on what yeah. Ram is saying. On the other hand, so yes, it gets harder the older we get, and that's part of the reason that we want to get a really good running start. But also, and this speaks to the fact that not everybody gets a good running start, and some people are experiencing trauma and abuse, and you know, there's so many ways that, in fact, the world can interfere, mm -hmm. at least for some time, with getting yourself on a good track. But and my bias as a therapist is to be more optimistic, just generally, partly because I want to instill hope in my clients, even if they are 40, 50, 60, and still unhappy and feeling stuck, but also because I've actually seen the evidence, because I myself have really moved farther to the more optimistic end of this trajectory, having worked with people in their 70s mm -hmm. who had become really traumatized when they went to Vietnam, and came back and used alcohol to escape the fact that th they were dealing with really unthinkable, horrible, traumatic memories, and then kind of got into some conventional blue collar job just so that they'd have something to do all day. And then they get to 70 and believe it or not, at that point, change is still possible to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen, I mean, it, it's miraculous to me, or, or seemingly so, except that it makes sense. And to answer kind of the earlier question, you know, what do you do if you're already 50 and loaded down with all these obligations? It looks different depending on the context of your life, mm -hmm. but the principles are the same. So if you're 50 and you're loaded up with responsibilities and you can't just up and you know quit and move to Hawaii and just start fresh, mm -hmm. but that's the struggle that you're now facing, there are heroic things that you can do. You know, there are, even if it means, so you know, yes, I'm going to start taking a night class or I'm going to start actually asserting myself to my boss who has never really let me venture out and you know, try different projects and I'm actually going to start pushing the boundaries of how creative I can get in this job. Mm -hmm. And that is fulfilling and rewarding and challenging and meaningful. Mm -hmm no less, perhaps more in some ways, because yeah. it's harder yeah. and takes more of that inner oomph than a 20-year-old who just unconflictedly you know, goes off and makes an app. Yeah, it's also interesting that someone at middle age, 40, 50, whatever that is, maybe not the seven-year-old, could think that it's too late. I think that yeah. people. I think people really get that in their mind that it's yes. too late. Yeah. Particularly I've today, when that. when we're yeah. going to live, you know, when we're living into our nineties quite easily, and I think that's absolutely right. And the other thing is that I think people in their forties and fifties, you know, who who have a particular job, a lot of people don't enjoy their job because they've conditioned themselves not to enjoy their job. They don't challenge themselves in yeah. the job. They don't push themselves in the job. See, yes, it might not be your ideal job, it might not be the most fun job, but you can make it better. You can make it more challenging, you can make it more interesting. So going to your boss and demanding to be challenged more or, 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 or just doing the job in a different way. I mean, again, one of, the, one of the principles here is live every minute. So even if you're a, even if you've got a menial job, figure out how to do the menial job the best way that you can do it, and you'll find some, 
some joy in it because you'll be doing it better. You'll have challenged yourself. You've have achieved something mm -hmm. in that. Um, Absolutely. You know, it, it, distributing flyers in Times Square. I'm sure some of what was going on in your mind is, how can I do this better, or how can I? Yeah, well, I would try yeah. to. I would try my best yeah. to make it fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, and whatever I could say to people to make yeah. them laugh on the street. Yeah. And but it, trust me, it was still miserable. I'm sure yeah. it was miserable. <laughs> Absolutely. And yet you were practicing your craft. Yeah. And I bet it served you later on when <laughs> you were actually standing up in front of people making them laugh. You yeah. know that you had gotten to try different iterations. You wouldn't have known at the time how exactly it would serve you, right? But you were exercising your chops, right? Yeah. Like you were showing up and you were engaged in actively making choices and noticing patterns. And in a certain way, it almost doesn't matter mm -hmm. in what setting you first end up doing those things. And it doesn't really, this is one thing I teach my clients who think it's too late, that there is no one correct blueprint that exists somewhere in a platonic universe that's you know waiting just like there's no one soulmate you know mm -hmm. it's kind of the same idea that we're the ones who create the purpose and the meaning and that could look a million different ways but there are features that have to be there yeah, yeah. well also the fact that if I hadn't struggled, and if anyone hasn't struggled, it, it makes the now much more rewarding, right? If you had just been, if you had just right. reaped all the benefits from day one, you get out of college, yeah. holy cow, I got the greatest job ever, I'm rolling in dough, I've got everything. It's kind it's, of well, lame. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if it's, Most likely that doesn't end well, probably, yeah. and right? And I don't want to overemphasize the struggle in the sense of suffering. Yeah. I think it's the challenging that's important. People are challenged, so it's not like, I don't really believe that to be a great artist, you have to you have to starve for a while or whatever. But I do think you have to challenge yourself. You have to push yourself. You have to do things you've never done before. You have to learn new skills that you haven't ever done before. Um, it's not that somebody who has money can't be happy because it's too easy for them. It's it's what do they do mm -hmm. with their life at that point? Uh, so it's the, it's the challenge, it's the setting a goal, it's the achieving that goal, it's making those goals difficult is, is what ultimately leads. And kind of the theme that you've been talking to a lot of our intellectuals about is happiness. These are the things that lead to happiness. It's, it's achieving those goals. It's, it's you it know, challenging yourself. Yeah, that, that's why I hate the phrase money is the root of all evil because it's like, it's not that money's the problem, it's what you're doing with it or how yeah. you feel about it that actually is the problem, not the money. If you've got some money and, you, and you're and you a positive good person who's doing something right, you can do a lot of good stuff with that but money. There's a, well, there's a sense in which it's the opposite, right? I mean, there's a sense in which money is the root of all good because, because what does money represent? Money represents the value you've created. So to the extent that you're generating money, it means in a, in a free society, in a, in a honest way, it represents the fact that you're, you're doing something good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would view money as properly understood as the root of all good, not all good, but a root of good. Yeah. For a symbol and, of good, right? right. And, and a symbol of good and the accumulation of money, of or, the, or the, <laughs> yeah. as your income increases, it means you're producing more value. That's a good thing, not a, not a bad thing. And it's not like, and this is part of the, in the culture, there's this attitude of, yeah, I'll make a lot of money, then I'll get good stuff. Well, how did you make the money? You made the money by producing values that are good in and of themselves. I mean, to me, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and these guys don't need to apologize for making the money by giving it away afterwards. They've already changed my life by just making the money. Which right. is, they, they don't owe you more? No. I, I, I mean, I, I always say yeah. if I met a billionaire, in, 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 you know, I, if I met a billionaire, I wouldn't say, you know, I would say thank you. Because the only yeah. way to become a billionaire in a free society is to create values that all of us benefit from. It, it, hundreds of millions of people have to benefit from them so that they can become billionaires. Yeah, yeah. so one of the insights and in objectivism that has been really eye-opening for me is this idea that people who go after money as if that will somehow give them self-esteem and happiness and status, they're reversing cause and effect. Mm -hmm. This idea that somehow if I pile up a bunch of wealth and if I'm basically, if I look from the outside or if I'm going through the motions of being someone really impressive and productive, that will give me the rewards of being someone impressive and productive. You know, then I'll be happy and I'll feel good and I'll be so proud of all my, but that's not how it works. Like the money is the effect, not the cause. The, mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't magically alchemize you into someone who earned it and someone who understands the value that you've created. So I think that's what makes 
people think money is the root of all evil. At least that, mm -hmm. I think that's one aspect of it. Yeah. So let's let's shift a little bit sure. uh, and talk sure. about art. How does art play into this? Now you guys, are, you're in my home, and I've got I've got a <laughs> yeah. lot of cool yeah, art. I mean, cool. even in the studio, these yeah. are all these are all original pieces that I've commissioned people for, and I love looking at something, yeah. uh, having something that fits in a room properly, that, that makes me feel peaceful or yeah. makes me think or, or whatever it might be. So how, how is art a piece of all this? So. You know, we live in a world, as human beings, we're dealing with abstract knowledge, we're dealing with abstract ideas, with long-term plans, and art concretizes some of these ideas for us in a way that nothing else can. Mm -hmm. It gives us an instant image of, yeah, that's the life I want. You, you look at a beautiful painting and you go, yeah, I want to be there. Yeah. I, want, I want to be on that beach. I want, you, you know, the, the sense that you're getting from the, from the painting is, that's the life I'd like to live. Well, there, there's a guy we know, I don't know if he wants to be mentioned in this, if you want to mention his name, you can, that at his house has that incredible <laughs> wall-sized yep. painting yeah. that I walked into his house and yeah. I thought, that it blew my mind. Yeah. It yeah. blew my mind. It was actually the inspiration for one of my paintings out here. Was that the Icarus or the, or the, space, the, the, space, the space one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so you look at a painting like that and you go, you know, beyond, wow, that's cool because it's so big. It's like, it's, it, it's, it's wow. You know, isn't that cool that human beings can be out in space like that? Isn't yeah. that cool? It's basically, that, for, just for those obviously uh, oh. who haven't seen it, it's, a, it's a, <laughs> sort of behind an astronaut floating in space with the panorama of yep. the universe cool. heading out, yeah. and it's just mind-blowing. I mean, when I go, when I, you know, I love Florence, and one of my favorite places in the world, and one of the first things I always do in Florence is I go see Michelangelo's David <laughs> at, the, at the Academy, and, and, and it's beautifully lit and everything. And I can just sit there for <laughs> hours. I mean, it's like, wow, I mean, here's a hero. Here's what every aspect of what I want to do in life is captured here. You know, I'm not a hero in the physical sense, but I, you know, I, I try to strive towards, and here's a perfect young man standing up to Goliath with that confident look, with a sling on his shoulder, relaxed muscles, and that, it inspires me. It, it gives me energy to go for a year you know, fighting all the battles that, that we fight on, yeah. on all kinds of fronts because I know, hey, if David could stand up to Goliath, right, who, you know, the troubles I have are, are minor in comparison. And yeah. I think anybody in whatever aspect of their life, and this is why I think people love uh, m movies uh, w with good and evil and, and heroism, is because they, whatever struggles they might have in their day-to-day -day lives, their life is not being endangered. They're not. The world is not going to be blown up by uh, what? Uh, you know, you're the you're the Trump. Oh, oh no, oh, you're no, 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 aliens the or something. Star yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's Death not star, some Death Star. Death Star. The that's going to star. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I know. I apologize. You, <laughs> this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so the world's not going to be destroyed by this, and they can get wow. They, you know, here's a projection of heroism in, in the face of this incredible. And yeah, it's a movie, but the whole point of a movie is. You're living it, right? It, it's why you want, you, you like, it, it, the best movies you see in a dark place where, where it's a big screen and you're immersed in the experience. And you get that emotional fuel without even thinking about it. It's yeah. not like you sit there and you go, okay, so the good guys and the bad guys, and yeah, I want to yeah. be the good guys. It's, it's an emotion. Yeah, it's, it's, you respond to it emotionally. Yeah, so Rand had this concept of a sense of life, it probably has come up in other conversations, and it's this idea that all of these abstract ideas that we come to hold and this worldview that we have about like who we are and what's possible, all this, it exists in us as this emotional leitmotif that's kind of always there. It's like the, the backdrop of our life. And when we look at a work of art, the emotional sum that we experience, even before we know what it means or how to explain it to somebody else, is either, the way Rand would put it is like, this is what life means to me, or mm. this is not what life means to me. And really great art, one way or another, it'll elicit a strong reaction because it's capturing an essence of something, kind of, you know, looking at Michelangelo's David. You know, the, the works of art that probably most people watching at some point have had an experience where they looked or they, you know, they watched a movie, they read a book, they w looked at an artwork and tears filled their eyes. Mm -hmm. and, you can learn a lot about yourself and about what is important to you and what kinds of moments you want to promote in yeah. your own and, life. And, and again, I think, I think we don't teach kids and young people how to, how to relate to art and how to appreciate it and, and what it can
can mean for them. And I think a lot of people dismiss museums and they dismiss, I don't know, opera, or they dismiss certain types of music because they don't know what to do with it. And, mm -hmm. and it goes back to not, not training them, into, not helping them introspect, not helping them identify their values. A lot of people look at art and nothing happens because I think the reason is they haven't identified their values. It's not reflecting back anything to mm -hmm. them. It doesn't mean anything to them. So it goes back to this, because we live in a culture that has demeaned self-interest, we live in a culture that tries to train us to be public servants, to help others, to, to sacrifice, to, uh, to, you know, to you talked person. before about something right. about other people's, you know, don't take personal responsibility, you're, you're a product of your genes, or you're a product of your environment, or you're a mm -hmm. product of the political system. We don't teach people to own themselves, to own their mind, to really craft it in a proper way then they miss out on these amazing experiences that I, think, that I think you can get from art and that they need from art. That's the other thing is mm -hmm. all these things we're talking about today, career, arts, and we'll talk about romance in a minute, all of them are things that you, I think to be successful as a human being, to live a good life over the long run, you need. It's interesting to me also how they become self-evident. So, for example, we are sitting in my, I mean, I've related everything yeah. into my life today, yeah. but, but I think there's a reason for that. <laughs> yep. There's a purpose, be behind, here. Yeah, there's a purpose <laughs> behind that, right? But, I mean, when we designed the studio yeah. and, and had, you know, commissioned this yeah. piece and this yeah. piece, I wanted something that felt a little bit like chaos and yeah. order. Yeah. Hmm. The artist who, who did this, Kaylin Janet, she actually, because she knows I love coffee, yeah. the texture yeah. on that painting yeah. is actually made out of coffee grinds. <laughs> and we wanted Aww. something that felt yeah. a little futuristic-y yeah. and also a little yeah. spacey and all those things yeah. because I wanted to walk into a a room that I felt represented me and that that you guys look good with you know the companion piece that's behind you right now um, but I, but I want to do one thing before yep. we jump into romance which is you've related this to stories and the yes. importance of yes. stories yes. now in most of the conversations that I've had with you guys uh, Jordan Peterson's name has popped yeah. up yeah. and I think he's with he's with uh, objectivism on most of these key points the the, the one split and we're not going to do the whole split here is with that he finds a certain value in the biblical stories as where, uh, where you guys, I think, would find the value in just whatever the stories are, whatever the story that matters to you, right? So I think there are deeper, there are deeper differences, the, and I think, I think even when it comes to the story. So, so it's not that I don't find uh, meaning or value in the biblical stories. I do. I might not find the same values he does or yeah. I might interpret them differently. But he relates it to something metaphysical that exists, mm -hmm. that, the stories, that the stories are coming out of some kind of metaphysical reality that's out there. And, and, and I don't see it that way. I, I see some artists, very creative people, who wrote, who wrote this book called The Bible, and there are interesting stories there, and, and the stories can inspire in certain circumstances and can horrify in other circumstances. And I think to be objective about biblical stories or any stories, one has to be willing to accept that some of the stories, you know, the idea that Abraham's gonna kill his oldest son, is in, in the idea that he becomes a moral hero for saying yes to God to kill his oldest mm -hmm. son is a horrific story and, and in my view is, is you know why you want to be careful of religion yeah. and, and, and you want to reject and religion. And I've heard him take the opposite point on that. And, and, I may, and maybe we'll get you guys to sit and down. I know, and I'd love point. to, yeah. you know, that would be a great conversation to talk about that yeah. and, and yeah. to talk about the meaning, but, but it's a simple story. So I, I encourage the audience to think about what the story means. It and means be agree? obedient. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, so I think Jordan is right when he talks about he talks a lot about Dostoevsky. He, talks, he does a lot with Pinocchio in Disney movies. He's right that stories are incredibly meaningful for people because they reflect everything we've talked about. They reflect the values and they, they reinforce certain values or they reinforce the rejection of other values. And a lot of how our culture is shaped, this is why Hollywood's so important, a lot of how our cultural attitudes are shaped about certain things is through movies, it's through stories, it's through books, it's through novels. You know, if you read Dostoevsky and you read Ayn Rand, they're both, in my view, great authors, great literary figures, and yet they are projecting completely opposite mm -hmm. views of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that I love Ayn Rand and, and Jordan Peterson loves Dostoevsky because we have very different attitudes towards certain aspects of life that are reflected in those choices. And, but, I think what he's got, which is absolutely true and where we agree, is the power, the power of the story, the power of art, 
of the power of particularly literature because it is so conceptual. It is the most conceptual of all that. It tells, it deals with ideas. Dostoevsky yeah. deals with ideas. I think he's wrong about those ideas. And Jordan thinks he's right about those ideas, and that's where we disagree. I think Ayn Rand's right about the ideas. Other people think she's wrong. But they all, but good literature deals mm -hmm. with something really big and, yeah. and, and really important. And I think that's why art is so important because it's important to all our lives to get the values right. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because the important. metaphysical part that you reference, whether yeah. that does exist or not, is almost, that seems secondary to me than, than what you just said there. Which I think is, so, certainly in terms of the experience, yeah. it's secondary, yeah. absolutely. So, but yeah. I think it's related to a point of probable difference, if I understand his perspective correctly, that the idea that stories reflect ideas and that ideas aren't just born in us, that we have to decide what we believe and that we have to actually form a view and we can disagree in our views. So, so the stories are products of the ideas that people hold. There's a reason why the biblical stories are what they are, because yeah. because of the ideas that the people who wrote the stories had and wanted to convey to people. There's a reason why Dostoevsky wrote the books he did, because he had a certain worldview and he wanted to portray that. Ayn Rand, you know, came up with a whole new philosophy and to project that philosophy, she had to write completely new stories. Right. And it, so the stories are, uh, uh, you know, the, the ideas are not out there. The ideas are something we have to create, we have to figure out, we have to own. And it's up, again, going back to young people, it's their responsibility more than anything else to figure out what their values are, to figure out what their ideas are, and they'll respond to art in accordance yeah. with what those ideas so, happen so to be. So one more thing on this, which sure. is, do you think we're in a little bit of a deficit when it comes to creativity and art? So for example, every show that comes out now is just a remake of a show in the in the 80s. Or, and every movie, instead of coming up with new characters, is a reboot of something else. Or, or even the superhero, the Marvel movies oh that I love. I, I love them actually, <laughs> yeah. but I love them actually, but, but it's, the, the it's, the same it's, old, the same. it's the same old characters. And I, but the I'm, same characters and the same story over yeah. and over and over again. And yeah. it, there's no in, question. Infinity the last one was pretty spectacular, but I've but, sworn off all superhero movies, partially because I find it, I find it really, I think part of what's reflected in the culture is that to create a hero today, to have a hero in art, uh -huh. they have to be super, right? We can't just have a hero, right? We well, that's sort have, of where I was going and, with this, and, yeah. And, 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 you know, if you go back to movies in the 50s, and you could have you could have a regular human being be heroic. If you look even at Hitchcock, a regular human being put in a crazy situation, rises to the occasion and does incredible things. They didn't have to have superpowers in order right. to do that. So it, it drives me nuts that every hero today has to be a superhero. But there's no question there's a deficit. If you think of the if you think of the transition in art, right, between the eighteenth century and the nineteenth century and, and the kind of revolution that happened during that period, whether it was in music, in literature, in, in painting, in sculpture, in every one of these areas, there was a burst of productivity. And I don't think it's an accident. It com coming out of the Enlightenment, coming out into this era of freedom, political freedom, that artists were suddenly free to, to create and to produce and to do new stuff. And the idea of sitting at a, at a coffee shop in, in Paris with Victor Hugo and, and, and some of the great sculptors and painters of the period, and, I just don't think we have that level of, of creativity and that level of genius as applied to the arts. And I think it's a reflection again of the culture and a reflection again of the, of the lack of introspection and thinking and, and taking seriously of, of people's own lives. Then again, yeah. and this is, I guess I'll represent the optimistic contingent here. <laughs> so we were just talking the other day, Ron, about Hamilton yeah. and what a phenomenon it is. You know, the, I mean, mm -hmm. everyone's heard of Hamilton, yeah. right? And it's interesting that it's a phenomenon that really cuts across political aisles and that spans historical eras. And it, it should be either hated or ignored by everyone on this premise, that, or it shouldn't exist, period. Because it's this dramatization of this American hero who defies the odds and who combats, both literally and figuratively, someone who isn't principled and is pragmatic and they duke it out at the level of ideas, right? In rapping rhyme and but at the level of intellectual engagement that mm. I think we find in some of the art of the 18th and 19th century. And it's a sensation. People are starving for People it. People are starving for great art. They really are. Now, 
I mean, I loved Hamilton. I've seen it twice. I just saw it now in Puerto Rico with uh, uh, with Manuel, Miranda, with, yeah, Miranda. So yeah. it was it was pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, but it ain't very it ain't very opportunity. <laughs> it just ain't. And I also think it's possible right. that we're so inundated with information and entertainment and everything else that we actually can't see the forest for the trees right now. That often there is great art out yeah. there. I mean, people are watching this on YouTube. I'm, you can, I don't want you to click out of this, but there's a lot of interesting, entertaining, artistic stuff that's happening that's just not maybe uh, loved I, by the mainstream. I agree or, with that, although, yeah. although yes. most of it reflects values that I, that I think are, are antagonistic, at least, to, to, to many of my values. So there's, there's a very good, they're very good TV shows mm -hmm. that, that show bad people what happens to bad people, but there are very few TV shows, good, well-written TV but shows, that show heroes, <laughs> that show real heroic activity, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it's, it's challenging. So, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy movies, I enjoy TV, and I, and I watch a lot of it, and, uh, and there's, there's good stuff there. And one of the things, so let's get back to living a good life. One of the things that I think is so important for the individual to do is to find the stuff they like, yeah. right? To, and, it's not, it, and it doesn't have to be Michelangelo's David, it doesn't have to be Verdi and Puccini, right? It, it can be at whatever <laughs> level, at whatever kind of art that you love. Fill your life, fill your life, just like you're gonna pursue the great career and you're gonna be passionate about, fill your life with beautiful stuff. You know, we might not share the same aesthetics, but the important thing is that, that the focus on it, and again, I don't think we, we encourage people to do that, but a life surrounded by beauty and a life which is, involves aesthetic experiences is part of a life well lived. And I, don't, I really don't think you can live a good life yeah. without having that, those kind of experiences. It, it also lets you connect with people in another yes. way because if you, if you surround yourself with great yes. art and then someone walks into your home and acknowledges it, Absolutely. you actually feel a connection with yeah. them in, in yeah. a different way. All right, yeah. so. Which brings uh, us to. There's a lot of things, which brings us to <laughs> love. Let's talk about love. How does love, <laughs> we've talked a lot about like here, but how does love? fit into the equation here. Yeah, so what you get from art, because so, there is actually a connection here, that art is this embodiment, this symbolic embodiment of what is possible and of the kind of world you could imagine yourself living in. Well, love is the actual experience of being in such a world and having such people populate your world. So when you fall in love with a person, it's not, it's like the two-sided equivalent of falling in love, in love with an artwork, right? In the sense that there's actually another human being with a mind that sees what you see and that actually embodies in their person and the ways that they laugh and the ways that they move and the kind of career that they're pursuing that inspires you, that they are this external concrete embodiment of what makes life worth living for you. And they see that in you too. You know, and that visibility, both okay, the, that dual experience of being visible and of being able to admire and be inspired by someone who's seeing you back, is I think one of the core components of a life worth. God, as you were saying that, I was thinking, man, I know a lot of people that are married to the wrong people. Yeah. yeah. Know. You know, like how many, the really way you sad. just described that, which is such a beautiful explanation yeah. of what love is, I yeah. think I have that. I, I hope you have that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think you have I'm that. I'm happy to say um, yeah. we all finally but, but, do. but it was just yeah. striking me the way you were saying it was so poetic. It was like, wow, I know a lot of people that sad. do not look yeah. at their spouse and, and, and yeah. feel that. And, or, it, and it's sad it's when that happens because. It's hard to find, but when it happens, it's it's such an amazing, an amazing part of what life is about. But just to broaden it a second, I mean, to some extent, everything we've talked about is about love, right? And and I, I view, I often say objectivism is the philosophy of love. Uh, right? Now he's gonna get sappy. Should we lay in some music? Absolutely, while you're doing you can, you can <laughs> run you can run the Puccini in the background. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's yeah. about it's about learning to love yourself and, and being worthy of your own love. Right, and and I don't think you can love another person fully unless you, you know, you have to. I, I answer is in order to say I love you, you have to be able to say I, and you have to know what I means, and you have to know yourself, and you have to like yourself, and you have to love yourself. It's about loving yourself. It's about loving the world. It's about loving your career. It's about loving the environment you create around you. It's about loving your, the experiences you have. And then, at the, at the, in a sense, the peak of that is finding another human being that reflects all that back to you, that gives you visibility into those values that you can share those experiences with, and that that you know it, it, is, it laughs with you and 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 uh, loves the. I mean, on the aesthetic side, imagine if your spouse hates all the art that you you know. Yeah. I mean, wow, what a conflict! And yeah. and I've I've seen that happen. I, I you know I in a previous life. 
I actually owned a, a framing store where we sold, we sold art. And, um, and people used to come in and get, the, the, the husband would come in and say, oh man, I love that stuff. This is gorgeous, I'd love to. But my wife would hate me, would hate it. I can't buy any of it because my wife would hate it. Or the other way around, right? Yeah. And, and wow, and I'd look at them and say, that's pretty sad that yeah. you guys don't, you know, that's kind of a real fundamental. At the, ver at the very least, you need a second house, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Or, you, or a, a hideaway yeah. or, yeah. or a special yeah. rumors thing. Yeah. So, so obviously objectivism talks about rationality a lot. Love doesn't strike me as totally rational. No. How, do you, how do you bridge that divide? Yeah, so I think rationality as the means to living the best life possible is completely not only applicable to but necessary for finding and sustaining the love of your life because A, what we were just talking about, you have to know yourself, right? So you have to actually be able to extrapolate from your experiences of the art you respond to, but also the people you interact with and the things that you do like and the things that you don't and what patterns you notice and you know why, why did I enjoy spending time with this person and I didn't feel drained by the end of our date or by the end of you know the party whereas this other person like I think I should like them better like they you know they meet these criteria on my list but for some reason I just don't feel like I was tired and wanted to go home mm -hmm. like what what was happening there does that mean I should change my standard or does that mean maybe you know my subconscious is telling me something and maybe I should figure out like what it is that made me respond better to this person let me gather more data let me do more introspecting all that falls under the heading of rational thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least as we think. And, and it's it. necessary because it's easy to fall in love with the wrong person. It, it's, easy to, it's easy to confuse passion with love. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to, to not like somebody and, and later on discover what a mistake that was because they're actually a great human being. It's easy to just fall into kind of an emotional, just follow an emotion. And I think what, what objectivism says is, yeah, we experience, emo you know, you live through your emotions in a sense. You experience life through your emotions. You want to experience strong emotions. It's great, particularly the, the positive ones, but, but the negative ones, the bad emotions are important too because they tell you something's wrong. But you've got to monitor. You've got to, you've got to think about them. You, you don't rush into marriage without thinking about, well, are we really compatible? Are, do we really see things? Is this love, does this love make sense, right? So, so you, have to, you have to monitor that and sometimes we know that our emotions change. We, we, you know, we discover something new about somebody, you know, we analyze it, we yeah. say, you know, they're not the person I thought they were. Yeah. And suddenly you don't love them anymore. So it's not like love is infallible, it's not like love is permanent, it's not like, but it's so crucial to living a good life. So invest the time, the thinking, the effort in finding somebody that you really do love and that it is sustainable. So it, it's interesting that uh, we've linked some of this to technology and how things have changed in a modern sense. What, what was the phrase when the kids go back to home and they don't get out? What was the phrase you mentioned before? Uh, failure to launch. The failure to launch phase. Yes. Do you think there's an interesting play right now where it's like because of apps and the ability to swipe through human beings all the time, it's like you're looking, you're almost looking for something that would never, could never exist in a bizarre way. So you've got people that can meet more people than ever, right? And you can hook up more and you can go on more dates, but actually to, to find what you both are laying out here has become much harder because of this. Well, I think it's as much, I think like any tool, it can be a weapon of good or a weapon of evil, depending on how you're using it and with what intent and what kind of rational perspective you're bringing to it. So I have worked with multiple clients to use dating apps in a way that actually fosters a healthy dating and relationship process. And I've also seen and lived through tons of really terrible decision making enabled by dating apps. So I feel like to the exact degree, I don't know exact, but roughly you know, to the extent that dating apps make it easier to be dumb, you know, make it easier mm. to make rash decisions and to, to stalk people and to ghost people and to be really emotionalistic and irresponsible in your dating process. To that same extent, it also enables you to be thoughtful and selective and to actually, you know, read someone's profile and get a sense of their style before you even meet them so that instead of meeting random people at a bar and, you know, hoping maybe that by some crazy stroke of luck they'll turn out to be interesting, mm -hmm. like you've already culled your sample in such a way that you know that the person you're gonna meet is 
someone who values education and someone who you know, isn't, if you're religious, they're religious, if you're not, you know, that they're, that they share your values, that they at least claim to want, you know, to be ambitious in their career and have interesting things to talk about. That's such a huge head start. So I really th I think it depends on how you use it. So it it really I mean bring, I, bring I, us home, you're right. I mean I know people who've who've uh, who found their soulmates uh, using these apps. Um, but you know I remember long long time ago, right? Going on a Friday night and uh, you know being in a place and basically going like this, right? But it was it was <laughs> but in reality. It was yeah. in reality, but, but it was sample. exactly the yeah. same thing. It was a smaller exactly. sample, and you knew a lot less about them because all you could see is the if you were is probably if you were thing. going like this as the women walked by, it probably <laughs> did, it probably did not <laughs> end well. I, you know, it never ended particularly well for me anyway. But, <laughs> but eventually, uh, it did. <laughs> eventually it did. But that was more her initiative than mine. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. It's what you do with the information you get. I mean, we're, we're very quick to blame technology for a lot of the problems that we have. We're very, you know, people's, people complain about looking at the iPhone, right? I remember when everybody complained of looking at television. And before, I, my mother used to complain about me reading too much. Huh. Reading too much as a teenager. I wasn't out there with friends enough. There's always, parents have always found some reason <laughs> to think that the latest technology was a problem for their kids. But I think to, to really wrap this up, I think that, what objectivism really is about, for, for hopefully for, for the people watching, should be about, is, is this idea of taking your life seriously. It's this idea of figuring out what your values are. It's the idea of using your reason to, to understand reality, but to understand yourself. And, and a lot of what we talked about here today is about understanding yourself. Yeah. What is the career you want? What are the values you want to pursue? What are the challenges you're willing to take on? What is the things that you think are beautiful? And, and even there, just like with a career take in night school, I encourage people, go take a, a, a arts appreciation class. It's fun, and you'll learn so much, or music appreciation class. And break out of, you know, this generation listen to rap, and I'm sure there's good rap, but, but go listen to some music, you know, from, from other periods, and you'll, you'll find a whole other world out there. Uh, you know, I discovered classical music in my early 20s, and I was blown away by it. Um, so, so do something, act, make yourself better. And, and of course with love, don't sit at home just flipping the app. Go meet people, go date, go, go engage, go, you know. So pursue your life, pursue your passion, make the most of the one shot you have at this life. That's how you end the show right there. <laughs> All right, this is just one in a series of interviews I'm doing with uh, some of the top intellects from the Ayn Rand Institute. One of them, the first one, is on my channel, which we'll link to right down below, and we'll have a link to the other ones also right down below. Thanks for watching.